we're now live. Uh, good evening and welcome to the fifth session of the NUJS online lecture series hosted by the Student Juridical Association 2019 to 20 in collaboration with Live Law as our media partner. With us today, we have an extremely well-renowned personality, Mr. Vikramjeet Banerjee, who's the additional Solicitor General of India and actually the first National Law University graduate to hold this position. Mr. Banerjee would be talking on socialism and the constitution and would be taking a 30 minute question and answer session at the end of the lecture. So do let us know your questions in the comment section. The session would be moderated by Professor Dr. Anirban Mazumdar, who's currently a professor at NUJS. Professor Mazumdar has immense experience in the field of intellectual property law, currently teaching a course on the same and also having several publications in renowned mm -hmm. journals across the globe. Dr. Mazumdar is also a fellow of the Max Planck Institute for Intellectual Property and many such international organizations across the globe, as well as being a visiting professor at several prestigious universities. We'd like to thank both guests for agreeing to this discussion. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over the mic to Professor Mazumdar to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Aishi, and uh, good, good evening to everyone. Uh, let me welcome you all to this fifth edition of NUJS online lecture series. And let me take this opportunity to congratulate uh, President, Vice President, and other office bearers of Student Juridical Association of NUJS for taking initiative to organize this uh, lecture series. And I'm sure that our students are taking a benefit out of it, and uh, they are getting enriched by all the speakers in this series. Now, the country is going through this unprecedented uh, time of uh, pandemic mm -hmm. situation. Uh, due to the grace of technology, we all can connect to each other and we are taking advantage of that in this lecture series as well. Now, when we switch on to the television, we see two pictures side by side. One that, uh, you know, the, how celebrities are uh, spending time during lockdown by either cooking or some other thing, which is the uh, picture of modern India. And we also see the migrant laborers walking uh, kilometer after kilometer. And for a few of them, maybe the last walk of their life. And that's the Bharat. The, both the pictures are real. Both the pictures are the fact. And in this scenario, it is pertinent that we revisit our view of socialism uh, and Indian constitution. And who can do this job better than my good friend Bikamjit Banerjee? You know, uh, Bikramjit will remember we had a professor in uh, National Law School, Bangalore, called Professor uh, Devidas. Mm -hmm. uh, professor Devidas used to say that uh, there are different flavors of our constitution. Uh, he was of the opinion that our constitution is presidential, you know, giving a presidential form of government. So I'm sure that uh, Bikramjit will give us uh, his dimension of socialism. And, uh, and we, we'll see, uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll have a, a very interesting interaction. And uh, to introduce to you Bikramjit, uh, who is definitely known as uh, today Additional Solicitor General of India. Uh, he's also Advocate General of, uh, yes. where, uh, um, he, yeah, for, former Advocate General of, um, you know, uh, uh, Nagaland, Nagaland, yeah. And then he is a Sevening scholar. And more important identity for him is that he was former colleague of NUJS. You know, he is one of the founding faculty of NUJS, um, you know, um, uh, as institute. And I'm sure he remembers our initial days of journey in Aranavaban under Professor Menon's leadership. So uh, without wasting further time, I hand over the mic to uh, Vikramjit. Vikramjit, floor is yours. And let us Thank hear you. from him. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Onirban. I think uh, Onirban and myself, we go back a very long time. I think we go back to the National Law School where we studied together. And then we had the good fortune of uh, working together at uh, NUJS when it first started. Uh, I think just a small line before I start, I think uh, my being uh, a teacher at NUJS was as important in my journey as a lawyer, as much as my uh, studies at the National Law School. And I see both of them together. And I today, the success of NUJS 
I feel deep pride. In. I, I take great pride in that, and I identify a lot with NHS. Uh, that being said, I think the point which Anirban sort of ended his short introduction was also extremely crucial. But I won't address that because I don't want to address anything uh, which today smacks of too much politics. I'll only discuss the constitution and socialism. How has the court discussed it? And what were the politics of socialism which sort of underlines it? But to take off what to take off at the place where Oniban left it, I would only say this that you know all of us must realize that the pictures which you see as Oniban talked about, the celebrities working out and having their wonderful um, dinner and lunches, which they are putting on um, Facebook and Instagram, is inextricably linked with uh, the pictures of migrants. One of the reasons being that uh, the economy which we sort of promoted post 90s and which we were all very, very, very proud of had two faces. You know, we knew that and uh, it was an aspirational economy that we all aspired to that. But the truth uh, which this huge pandemic and this is once in a hundred years pandemic, once in a hundred years event has exposed is that how fragile uh, this entire scenario that we had constructed was. And that when uh, you took away the sheen of the wonderful sheen of the economy, which had sort of driven us for the last 40 years, it was based on uh, a very rough interior. That rough interior was based on a huge amount of exploitation, I would say, of of labor to maintain this uh, wondrous lifestyle, which uh, usually used to come on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, how we will deal with it after this pandemic ends, and I'm sure it will end, uh, is a question which we all need to contemplate at, contemplate now, because uh, you know we may not be able to at the present see the uh, end of the hill, but we will soon be at the peak of it. And then the only thing which we will see is, you know, coming down the hill. And when coming down the hill, this entire question of, uh, of poverty, of, of wealth, of what do we mean by socialism, um, are questions which are going to haunt us. So in many ways, this topic, which I intend to address before you, is a first off. I have tangentially written on it and publications in the SEC, but very tangential. Uh, but this is a question which I think we should address now, because this is something which we are going to face in the future. Now, socialism, as we know, is not a new idea in the Indian constitution. It is an idea which has uh, been there for a very long period of time. It was brought into the Indian Constitution, Constitution explicitly uh, by the 42nd Amendment. Uh, a lot of people are not uh, agreeable to that uh, amendment because they think that uh, that agreement, uh, that amendments were rushed and large parts of it was amended. But all of us also know and you know, know historically that uh, before India became independent, there was this huge debate which preceded India's independence. And the questions was, were raised a number of times as what sort of country would we inherit? Because we were coming from the British Raj into this independent country. Uh, like we all discussed about uh, secularism, and uh, we also discussed socialism. In fact, there was a huge faction in the Congress which uh, explicitly pushed for India to be declared a socialist country. But we must also realize that uh, that didn't actually work because there was a large amount of 
uh, people within the Congress who pushed back against this idea of socialism. Uh, we know Rajaji was one of them. We know uh, um, you know, Sadar Patel was one of them, and they were very explicit. In fact, some of the exchanges over socialism and the place of socialism in the Indian constitution and in the in the to-be Indian state was extremely bitter. Uh, one of the persons in the middle was, of course, uh, Pandit Nehru, uh, but on the on the left there were strong uh, proponents, people like uh, Acharya Narendra Dev people like uh, Jai Prakash Narayan, people like Ramon Ohar Lohia, who were part of a socialist group in the Congress and very, very um, adamant in pushing for a socialist state. And there were others, and I'll address that. And mm -hmm. on, on the right, if you so much look at it this way, was uh, uh, Rajaji. There was also very famously Sadar Patel. Sadar Patel, uh, came from very humble backgrounds, were farmers, came from a farmer's family, and he pushed against this uh, socialism a number of times. There have been very, very bitter exchanges. Somewhere between both, uh, you know, there were uh, Netaji Shuvashchandra Bose, who was a very charismatic fi figure in the Congress, and Pandit Nehru. Uh, but again, Subhash Chandra Bose, and, and since we are discussing this, we should also discuss this, and I'll address this in my topic later, had uh, views which could be today construed to be quite controversial. Uh, Pandit Nehru had very little to uh, specifically say about uh, socialism, though he was known to be a socialist, and his uh, in his first part of his autobiography about his travels to Russia, I wrote very glowingly about socialism, but uh, thereafter he seemed to be uh, shying away from taking a clear stand, uh, even during the Constitutional Assembly debates. Um, but for whatever it's worth, um, it's important to remember that it was greatly debated, this entire concept of whether we should have a socialist state and what sort of a uh, state should we should have post-independence was debated. It was uh, debated at the Constitutional Assembly level. And a number of times, just like secularism was attempted to be brought into the Constitution, socialism was also uh, attempted to be brought into the Constitution. In fact, a number of times, both of them were attempted to be brought in together as part of the same amendment. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm fond of saying this, that um, after this back and forth, back and forth, and after the numerous uh, attempts to incorporate socialism and secularism as, as parts of uh, the constitution, uh, famously Baba Sahib Ambedkar, who was, who was clearly not a socialist, in spite of the spin which has been given to him, he was a great economist. He had a, a doctorate, I think, in economics. He had a doctorate in economics from London School of Economics and a doctorate in law from Colombia. He was by no means a, a socialist uh, in, in the manner which we know. Uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar got up in the Constitutional Assembly and he said very, very clearly, he said, you know, we do not want our future generations to be saddled with any specific values. And that was the end of the debate. Now, uh, Katie Shah attempted to bring forth these amendments and KT Shah propounded gave a very long speech asking for socialism to be incorporated. And Baba Sahib, in that famous, now very off-quoted speech, uh, shot it down. Now, now let's come to the text of the constitution. This is something which we should you know, all talk about. Uh, where is sort of social justice? We, we knew one thing, and that's apparent to all, that we uh, that we were a poor country, there were differences in wealth, there are differences in status, there are differences based on economics, there were differences based on social differences. And we had to address that. Baba Sahib himself addressed that, uh, and he was at the forefront of that. Uh, but he did not classify himself as a socialist, but something as more akin to uh, a person who has uh, deep belief in 
for the want of a better word, market economics, but wanted uh, tools to bring in social justice. Now, so social justice was definitely, definitely incorporated into the constitution. Now, any one of us who've read the preamble knows that it was economic, social justice were incorporated in the, into the constitution, right in the preamble. And then specifically, uh, there are two provisions which all of us are very, very familiar today uh, because they have given rise to a large amount of contest, a large amount of uh, pushback and back and forth uh, is the concepts of reservation. Article 15 and Article 16. Now, they were both incorporated into fundamental rights, 15.3, 15.4, 16.3, 16.4. These are social justice provisions. These are social justice provisions which were specifically incorporated, incorporated into the constitution. And these were in many ways far, far ahead of their times. Because as we know, the South African constitution came much, much later to have these social justice provisions, which I think Baba Saheb, uh, because of his experience of being in, and studying at Columbia, uh, came back with, was, was incorporated into uh, the constitution as a means. Because in America, these questions were being hugely debated as to whether you should have reservation, what sort of reservations, whether reservation was a tool uh, to, to for affirmative action, if not uh, reservation, then what? The Americans went down on a different route altogether, but that's a, that's not the topic of this discussion today. Now, the other provision which was incorporated, which can be classified, is of course Article 17. Article 17 was the untouchability provision, which banned untouchability. Article 18, which banned titles. So in many ways, uh, even if we explicitly did not inherit a, a socialist state. We did inherit, a, in some ways, an egalitarian state because the ethos of the constitution at that point of time, for however we sort of inherited it, uh, was uh, egalitarian. Now, and I say this very specifically because uh, you know sometimes when I was young as well, and I've been at very different points of time, even explored this idea as to whether there was almost a libertarian constitution when we uh, framed it. Uh, it's easy and it would be, uh, I think, and, and in retrospect, not historically correct to say that we wanted a completely libertarian constitution, like the Americans. Uh, the Americans had a completely different history as to why they went in for a libertarian constitution, including the fact of the conflict with the uh, with their mother country at that point of time, Great Britain, and that is why they came out with absolute, absolute fundamental rights. But for us, uh, the question was more nuanced because the realization that we were in a deeply divided, unequal country, unequal society, led us to believe that we need uh, egalitarian constitutionalism. Uh, you know, even going back, you know, Swami Vivekananda, who was such a radical philosopher. Uh, always stress that you know you may be may not be a socialist, but in this country you have to be a person who has concern for the poor. So concern for the downtrodden, concern for the poor were like right up there in even Swami Vivekananda's consideration. That was in he died in 1902. So in 1898 onwards, there were people across the board. Um, you know why only Swami Vivekananda? There were large amounts of people who were deeply concerned about this concept of the unequal nature of the Indian society. So uh, this concept of socialism was always in people's minds. But, um, you know, another provision which, uh, you know, all of us have, I think, seen and all of us have uh, thought but never applied too much is the various different provisions in directive principles of state policy. Now, all of us know that director principles of state policy was not incorporated as fundamental rights, not made legally implementable, because uh, people could not arrive at a consensus is that whether we wanted, uh, you know, to bring those values into the constitution, which, as Baba Sahib said, so so those values which were perceived to be key to the running of this country, which we all aspired to, were sort of kept in a separate. Um, in a separate basket. And that was the directive principles of state policy. Now, all of us know that there were, um, you know, Article 38, which, which were the social provisions that said that, you know, the benefits of society should be distributed to, 
you know, to everybody and there should not be accumulation of wealth. And there were Article 39, which said material resources should be so dispersed so that it, you know, sort of benefits everybody so that it doesn't detract from the common good. 38 and 39 were, were very clearly uh, socialist principles uh, in many ways. I think they were, if somebody has to be inspired as to what, if there is any sort of a place where you can say that uh, the constitution is socialist. I think the inspiration would have to come from Article 38 and 39 of the constitution. Uh, if we take um, Article 15, 16, 17, and 18 to be social justice principles, there is <coughs> a, a group of uh, scholars who have always said that uh, social justice principles are, are, are primary and socialism was not too keen. But then if you go to directive principle state policy, maybe Article 38 and 39 can give you some inkling as to what uh, uh, the thinking at that point of time was. Now, <clears throat> of course, subsequently, uh, Article 51A was incorporated in the Constitution. And there was this huge caruffle over uh, Article 300A, that's the right to property. Uh, you know, I won't go into great details, our right to property, there was a right to property, it was subsequently taken away and then they could decide as to how to frame the fundamental rights and it was decided that you make it a constitutional right. Uh, 51A was incorporated, was classic, classic socialist constitutionalism in his thinking, you brought in fundamental duties. Uh, there is uh, nowadays a push to sort of construe Article 51A as uh, maybe uh, uh, rights versus duties, it is for the first time duties incorporated into the constitution and that's an Indian part of it. Sometimes even I've said that maybe you can use 51A to give an Indian flavor to the constitution. But at that point of time when 51A was brought in, it was clearly inspired by uh, socialist principles of socialist constitutional making because both Soviet Union, China, uh, you know, there was a great stress on the fact that you did your duty to your state and country. So these were the broad sort of provisions in the constitution uh, where, uh, you know, which could be seen as those provisions which in, inspired some sort of social justice, socialism, which were to dictate as to what sort of constitution we were. Then of course, famously uh, during the time when the right to property was made a constitutional right, uh, in and around that point of time, there was this huge struggle and. And uh, the government of that day uh, was going through a tough time and uh, they then incorporated by an amendment, the, they changed the preamble, incorporated socialism and secularism by the 42nd amendment famously in the constitution. Uh, the argument for secularism was that it was always implicit in the constitution. The argument for socialism still remained in the air, but it was specifically included because it was felt that they were the two cornerstones on which Indian constitution and Indian society was going to be based in the future. Now, in and after that, and, uh, the entire question then arose was, uh, you know, how important is socialism to the constitution? And uh, it is to discuss this issue in detail. It's very important as to how have the courts dealt with this entire concept of socialism. Uh, they've dealt with it variously, they've spoken on it variously, but you know, you can take it from me that they've not been very clear. At least in the question of secularism, the courts have been very clear. The courts have said very specifically that secularism means Sarva Dharma Samabhav, that is, you know, everybody is to be treated, all religions are to be treated similarly, similarly. or Ekam Sat Viprabahuda Padanti, it's like the wise treat, you know. Uh, there is one truth, then you know people treat it differently. The wise know that there is one truth, but Sarva Dharma Samabhav is the crux of the definition of secularism. In case of socialism, uh, I will take you in conclusion of what the Supreme Court has roughly come around, but there has been no perfect definition. Now, this entire concept of socialism and social rights and 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 and, and social duties and the struggle of socialism, what, what sort of a social friendly or of socialism friendly state we had has, has both happened in the polity 
which is extremely important to discuss when we discuss constitutionalism and when we discuss a constitutionalism which keeps in mind uh, the political developments because you know as i've numerously discussed and a number of times said that you cannot discuss constitution independent of your culture you cannot discuss constitution constitutionalism independent of the politics which happens now uh, the first sort of great challenge and first sort of great debate of socialism happened uh, in in india was on the question of land reforms now we know there was a huge back and forth of land reforms the congress had this as part of its agenda had part of as anti zamindari legislation as it would say it wanted to push forward these reforms because it said it was the key to make india a egalitarian state um this was you know a number of legislations happened this was uh, challenged in in court and on various times there was push back from the courts but uh, uh, the courts on various on various occasions including kameshwar singh pushed back against the government but the government eventually won the round uh, and sort of made these changes which the courts then upheld uh, uh, it's largely these changes were equitable distribution of land and uh, land sealings and expropriation of lands uh because at that point of time we thought to have a socialist constitution we should uh, have an equitable distribution of land uh you know all of us again who have an understanding of constitutional law and understanding of how important land is will know that it's not a uniquely indian issue though we tend to think it is a uniquely indian issue in post colonial states like zimbabwe in south africa that still remains a very very big issue as to who owns the land of the country uh the next question is uh, was of nationalization then this was the 70s where there was a huge move to nationalize industries uh because it was uh, taken to be that private entrepreneurs were largely exploitative in nature uh the this of course had a huge impact elections were won and lost general elections were won on the question of bank nationalization courts pushed back but eventually again the government of the day won and, you know we all you know red rc cooper but we know the courts pushed back but then the government of the day actually in conclusion won uh, a third area of great contestation of of socialism was the entire question of labor rights um you know you know this was the time labor rights was the time of uh, of krishna of, of there was a huge debate of labor rights there was uh, a large amount of how do you define labor what sort of benefits do they get what happens if there is uh, termination are they entitled to full wages uh, we have you know all of us know that we've all you know read firestone and there were a large number of judgments in around that point of time uh, though there were exceptions like excelware but nonetheless uh, the broad thinking was you know you should give full labor rights and labor rights should be given to maximum for so that the labor actually benefited and they were not exploited uh the the fourth sort of an issue which became the great crux of social justice and which remains the crux of social justice today there's a back and forth on that is the entire question of um, reservation which came to indra soni uh indra soni when it came you know the entire question of mandal entire question of obc reservation the entire question of meeting 154 164 was revolutionary now i don't know how much how many of you know that the entire question of caste is class which became to be a cornerstone of indian jurisprudence to an extent uh was formulated by the uh, by the supreme court uh, arose out of a of of a uh, absolutely near same framing of the principle of ramanohar lohia now lohia as or you know as any one of us have read lohia comes was a socialist he was a maverick a great socialist and still is sort of the inspiration for a uh, big political parties like rjd like samajwadi party samajwadi party so lohiaism is still remains a very very important uh, component of indian politics and lohia specifically spoke about uh, caste is class 
So this formulation was, was incorporated into Indra Soni, uh, which then becomes this area of huge uh, contestation because you move away from a principle where you actually said that an individual uh, could be treated based on an economics to something more than economics. So the criteria for giving him reservations so or giving him affirmative action does not anymore remain a merely economic class which he belongs to, but also social class, which thereafter translates into caste. So very interesting, very interesting. This was, for the want of a better word, some sort of social justice or socialism with Indian characteristics as uh, Ramon Oloya would have probably loved classifying it as. Uh, the third, uh, which, um, the, the, you know, the sort of the fourth or fifth, I think that's one, two, three, for the fifth big issue, which we sort of um, came, and this came to us recently, I, we're all in law school, but this came maybe uh, 10 years back, was right to land. I think uh, this was individual small farmers' right to land. Uh, this was the basis on which the now famous Singur, Nandigram uh, agitations were carried out. This became an all India movement against uh, land and uh, land acquisition because uh, it was felt at that point of time that small farmers were being deprived and land was being acquired and then given over to industry at throwaway prices. Uh, the Supreme Court again had a great say pushing the issue in Justice Singh's judgment in Greater Noida Authority. I think this entire question was pushed and uh, though Supreme Court, there was a Justice Sinha's judgment previously, which had talked about the question that maybe right to property, even though it was taken away as a fundamental right, was uh, and made into a constitutional right, still remained a human right. Now, all that, all the entire argument was brought back into these cases through uh, the entire agitation, which was a political agitation, and which was reflected in the court by Great Annoyed Authority. Um, and the last example, which I would like to say, is uh, is is workers' rights. It's, you know, this is the entire question of migrant workers' rights. Is what was the basis of the economy of um, post, for the want of a better word, post 1990s, the aspirational um, aspirational economy, which we had all talked about, which we were all very proud of, which was actually predicated on uh, on uh, contracted labor. And uh, so where do these, what sort of rights do these contracted laborers have? What do these, uh, this was a big site of contestation. Uh, you know, all of us would have known that there was even a time in the 90s when government was sort of employing, and it still does, it still does, to a great extent, employers uh, contracted labor. Previously, these uh, these appointments were, were regular appointments. There were government employees, but now the government decided that these were inessential functions in, in along with market economics. And uh, therefore the government wanted to vacate that space. So, and of course there was a huge amount of, I think labor issues, uh, issues about uh, of, um, of selection because selections tended to be greatly litigated. Uh, government uh, government jobs were highly prized, so they were litigated regularly in court. There was a huge sort of people wanted those government jobs. So the government decided to come out of employment and uh, sort of contract these uh, jobs out. And, and this entire politics of that was who would get it, whether there can be ad hoc appointments, whether government could then appoint whoever it wanted to, et cetera, et cetera, came before the court because there was a tendency of the government before that to appoint people whoever it deemed fit. So this entire question, one aspect of it came in Uma Devi, uh, where again, I think it was Justice Singh's judgment where they clamped down on this sort of employment, ad hoc employment, which the government, even the government was doing. Uh, so these are some of the areas which the Supreme Court dealt with, and these were actually live political issues. Um, you know, all these issues in many ways uh, sort of describes the concept of uh, socialism, uh, which pervades our constitutionalism as we as we as we as we have it today. Now, now I think, as I said, 
right in the beginning that when one discusses uh, the concept of socialism, one shouldn't, and as an Indian constitutional scholar, one should not, and that's my view, should not discuss only judgments or provisions of the constitution. Because both the provisions of the constitution, as I, and as I said, even, even the judgments are not given in a vacuum. They are specifically given in political context because there was a huge political debates also which permeate uh, constitutionalism. And you know, before I sort of come towards the end of my uh, talk, I would sort of highlight is what are the broad contours of socialist thinking uh, or the broad strands of socialism which we see in Indian politics. And this is very important for us to know because that would again help us to interpret uh, the constitution as we, as we see it in front of us and sort of identify as to what brand and what sort of interpretation we want our socialism. Uh, because this is socialism with Indian characteristics to be. One is of course social justice. You know, this is something which we are used to, something which we face every day. This is the question of reservation. Uh, you know, the entire question of caste is class, the entire question of uh, affirmative action, the entire question of whether identity is what is important for one to get benefits from the state or whether one should have uh, economic uh, deficit, and, you know, be economically backward in some way or the other. Now, this is an extremely important debate on socialism, on social justice, which permeates uh, our constitutionalism as we see it. And it's a live issue, all of us know about it. Uh, the other interpretation of socialism as we, as we have seen has been something which is um, not too much in vogue, but which is there in the constitution. There were Gandhian provisions in part of DPSPs uh, 38 and 39, as we discussed, um, which was articulated by Jai Prakash Narayan uh, and also by Deen Dalapata. And this is something which I think which we have to take into account increasingly. And this is what I will come back to right at the conclusion of my talk, is that they believed that, you know, you have to, an Indian definition of socialism would actually need to ensure that everybody's boat is lifted together. It was the uh, individual would have to be, the interests of the individual would have to be subsumed in the betterment of society. Now, uh, Gandhiji spoke about that. Gandhiji called it the word, he used the term Sarvodaya, uh, and which is an old Jain term. And this is something which I will return to at the end of my uh, talk. Uh, the other person who really spoke much about it and who came to be a great uh, uh, proponent of it and a great convert to it, because he started off as a socialist and then converted to it towards the end, was uh, the uh, famous uh, Janayak uh, uh, Jai Prakash Narayan, uh, because uh, JP always believed uh, that you know he was a socialist, and then he said that over a period of time, I have come to the conclusion that uh, Mahatma Gandhi was right, and when he said that you can't have individual rights, and he said I am disillusioned by the socialism of the West, and I think Gandhi's interpretation of uh, what he considered socialism. Uh, or, or Gandhi's interpretation of, of, of having a society where the interest of society subsumes that of the individual is something which you could uh, want to uh, follow. One of the reasons why, of course, he stressed is because you, he wanted Sampurna Kranti, which is root and branch revolution in society. And he looked beyond uh, parliamentary uh, politics itself. The, other person who spoke about something similar is Antodhya, which is which the Prime Minister quite refers to about Antodhya is by Deen Dayal Patel, where he says that you have to have daya or where the state should look after, that the obligation of the state is to have daya, is to look after the last person on the line, Antodhya, the last person on the line. So in any case, more or less, it's largely the same thing, that you, know, you have to ensure that the interests of both are uh, protected. Because the interests of society could, in some ways, ensure that the weakest are 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 not exploited, are not exploited to the wall, as as Vivekanand says, as Gandhi said, the, this is Sarvodaya was a method to ensure that the weakest were not exploited. So I think both Antodaya and Sarvodaya actually uh, sort of supplement and complement each other. 
The third way of interpreting uh, of, of, of having an economic map model is, uh, is what we call um, a Swatantra. Now, Swatantra is, of course, all of us are uh, famously aware of Swatantra because Swatantra itself was formulated by Rajaji. And this seems to be a cornerstone of all free market um, ideologues in this country when they all talk about Rajaji very fondly. And they quote only one of his writings called Why Swatantra, which he wrote at, uh, at the time of when he launched his Swatantra party, which was very obviously uh, in, in many ways a market-based uh, a party which sort of upheld the uh, individualism in many ways. Uh, but uh, this is my view that if you have to read Swatantra, you cannot cannot see, read it independently of another work of Rajaji called The Hindu Way of Life, where he said that uh, along with Swatantra, that is your individual right or right to do, you know, Swatantra being the ability to do anything, it has to be balanced by your obligation to ensure that you restrain your demands. So you, your, you cannot have an indefinite uh, sort of exploitation your right is tempered by your inher inherent uh, restriction which you place upon yourself. But he says that this inherent restriction should be upon the individual and it is the duty of the state to ensure that um, the individual sort of uh, confirms to this restraint which he has, which he puts upon himself. Uh, the third is, of course, uh, Samajvad. Uh, Samajvad, uh, the one... It's very important, uh, Samajwad, there are still Samajwadi parties uh, today. And I would flag uh, Ramonho Lohia, who talked about Samajwad. It comes directly from uh, Ramonho Lohia, who talked about social justice, who talked about uh, socialism with Indian characteristics, and where he spoke about that uh, there should be caste as class. And in India, he still says, still caste is an extremely important thing. And that famously, his famous formulation that there are three markers of, of um, you know, development in India is wealth, uh, English language, and upper caste. Uh, he, but that was his view on that. And there are still political parties who are uh, deeply um, sort of inspired by Ramon Oloya's formulation of Indian society, as well as the remedies to it. The other is a variation of Samajwad, which I like to say is something called Samyavad. Uh, which was Indianized central planning system. Uh, this was the word Samyavad is what uh, Subhash Chandra Bose formulated his version of socialism, uh, which he interestingly conceptualized as a, a halfway between, um, you know, of between fascism and and uh, and communism, and mm -hmm. with Indian characteristics, which will take care of the bad uh, sort of. Uh, bad aspects of both. Uh, so he wanted centralized planning, and this was uh, Samyavad of Subhash Chandra uh, The other was, of course, um, you know, socialism, which we all know. This was used as an active word in the 70s. And uh, this, I, I sort of look at it in this way. This seemed to be the thinking behind uh, the Indian National Congress's approach to uh, socialism. Uh, where this came out of Congress's thinking out of the Bombay plan. I don't know how many of you uh, read the Bombay plan. Please read it. Bombay plan was a plan which was came out with all India's top industrialists getting together and sort of just at the time of independence coming out with a formulation as to how is India to be governed or how is the economics of India to be governed more precisely. Uh, now, they sort of came out with this formula that the industrialists will be in charge of manufacturing and the distribution of it would be in the hands of the government, which would distribute it equally. This sort of this was socialism with Indian characteristics. Our middle path, which used to be so discussed in the 70s, and so you know, all of us who've grown up in the 70s and 80s know that it was hugely, very largely discussed, and was almost a, a way of life for us. Uh, and the last, I think, uh, is the entire concept of Swadeshi. Uh, which seems to be the flavor of the month. It's been discussed all over. Uh, now, Swadeshi goes through three parts of it. One is the formulation of Surendranath Banerjee, where Surendranath Banerjee discussed Swadeshi as 
actually a political tool. He said this is a political tool to ensure that people of our own country buy our own goods because the arrangement between India and Britain is based on exploitation and Britain was selling her goods to India. And if we go for a trade boycott of Britain, it would effectively uh, destroy the basis of the Indian British Raj. Uh, then, of course, was the much more nuanced policy. And I think this is something which you should all read. And this is something this part of Swadeshi I identify was uh, Lal Bal Pal's Swadeshi, uh, Bipin Chandra Pal, um, um, Lala Rajpatrai and uh, Bal Bandha Bhattilak. They came out with their own conception of Swadeshi at a different time. Before Mahatma Gandhi came onto the stage, where their Swadeshi was, India should manage, and this is what coincides with what uh, the Prime Minister uh, spoke about. And interestingly, is uh, was basically Swanir Bharata. What the Prime Minister talk, talked about is that you manufacture in your own country, you try to manufacture as much in your own country, but you trade with the world. You don't withdraw from the world. You trade with the world, but you ensure large amounts of manufacturing goes within your own country. Now, if you, uh, I would suggest if anybody's interested in reading, one should read Bipin Chandra Pal, who's discussed a lot on this, uh, on his conceptions of Swadeshi in great detail. Uh, the last is, of course, the Gandhian model of Swadeshi, uh, which based on a village centric life, which was based on Gram Swaraj, which based on, in very many ways, uh, rejection of the material civilization of, of the West and uh, sort of belief that. Uh, you know, we have to go back to the basics that we have to have cottage industries and it is cottage industries. It is the small industries and agriculture which forms the basis of the Indian state. And that is the sort of Swadeshi, that is the sort of socialism which we should all look forward to. Now, this is where this en entire concept and, and to conclude, this is the entire concept of where we are now at. Now, the Supreme Court in DS Nakara very famously said that, you know, our socialism, our socialism is a socialism which uh, sort of mixes uh, Gandhi and uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Marx. Uh, and they talked about Gandhian socialism. But, you know, I have a, I have a different take of it. Um, you know, I would like to say that um, the interpretation which the Supreme Court needs to give socialism in the future because these challenges will be faced by the Supreme Court again after a higher test from 1990 to 2020, a period of maybe 30 years, uh, because these questions of poverty will again come before the court, which the Supreme Court you know, had uh, some perchance, some ability to not address those questions. Um, because there is poverty is going to be a severe challenge subsequent to the pandemic, is the entire question of, you know, how to interpret the words of socialism, which permeates this constitution. You know, when Gandhi formulated this entire concept of, of Sarvodaya, he said, good of one person is enveloped in good of all. He said there should be dignity of labor and, you know, one should be proud of the work which one is doing. These were the cornerstones of, of Sarvodaya, which interestingly, he, he also sort of ins was inspired by another British author called John Ruskin uh, when he formulated this. But he enveloped it and he, he deeply enriched it with, uh, with Jain philosophy. So my view in the end is this, that uh, however much we talk about it, there are two sort of things which, uh, two sort of, pillars on which I see the future participation of Indian uh, socialism should be, and the court should take deep inspiration from it. One is the concept of Swadeshi, and, and I personally contribute more to possibly a pragmatic conception of Swadeshi, and, but also balanced by the conception of Sarvodaya. So if today uh, the challenge um, of to the Supreme Court would be to, to how to define uh, socialism in the Indian constitution, I would ask it to be inspired by both the two twin concepts of Indian concepts. And, and I say this very, very clearly, that we have to define it in terms of 
the Indian context of two Indian words of Sadeshi and of Sabodaya. Uh, I, I don't know how all this will play out, but we live in extremely challenging times. Uh, the future is, uh, it is, is difficult to comprehend. We may get, we will get through the pandemic. There is no problem. Uh, eventually we will, but uh, we will face very, very tough questions, both socially and economically once we are past it. And I think it's time that the Supreme Court takes a look at socialism and tries to balance uh, its views uh, in a way which is in consonance with both Indian culture, which includes both material needs and wants, but like Swadeshi and Sagodaya, also has a cultural and a spiritual effort. Thank you very much. Vikramjit, that was excellent, excellent. Uh, and very rich in history, as usual, as a trademark of Vikramjit's presentation. Uh, I, there are uh, several questions, but before we take a few of them, uh, Vikramjit, I, I just, uh, I'd like to have one comment from yeah. you. Yeah. No, it's uh, mainly based on policy that, do you think that for this disinvestment or privatization, should the government be given a free hand or should there will be a screening system where you uh, run them through the lens of socialism? Do you think that there is a need for that? I, you know, Anirban, I think in the end is, you know, we've had largely, as I said, from 1990 onwards, we grew up in the end. You, you've you seen me debating on free market in the National Law School. You would have seen me being one of the great propounders of Free market. I remember having uh, standing up to Babu Matthew, whom you would know as a socialist in National Law School, and telling him whatever you know is wrong, and whatever you you know you have studied is wrong. Uh, being very very um, you know aggressive about market welfare and believing that everything in the market is good, you know we've realized there is all of us have realized that we've been disillusioned by it. We've we've seen that not everything works in the market, and I think that in many ways, increasingly after the pandemic. And this is the reason why I chose this topic right now to speak about, is after the pandemic, we need to run it through that lens of, of Sarvodaya and Swadeshi. Uh, socialism, that's why I said it has to be a creative interpretation uh, of socialism. So we have to use these twin interpret, like we have done for secularism. We have Indianized secularism. We have said Sarvodharma Samabhav. So similarly, we need to use Indianized socialism and use Swadeshi and Sabodaya, both which have cultural terms and, and sort of run through it. I agree with you completely. Um, you know, Bikramji, there is there are a few questions. I'll take a few of them. Uh, one yes. of them is very pertinent for educational in institution at this point of time. This is a question by uh, Shuravi. Let me just say. Shuravi, one sec, one sec. Uh, yeah, Shuravi, uh, is deprivation of attending online classes due to poverty, poverty and infringement of uh, right to education or right to life of a poor student in a broad sense, if not under the purview of socialist pattern of our egalitarian society to provide every uh, opportunity to everyone to avail the technological benefit should have goes. Okay, I'll, I'll address that question. I think that's very, very interesting question because, uh, you know, and this question and this time, usually when we move from uh, one sort of, when we move from uh, socialist, a sort of a socialist government, which we sort of had, which we, we, we grew up in the 70s and then we moved to, in the 1990s to a free market economy, which Anirban and myself, we lived through those times and we saw how the world changed, we had some time to change. This has happened extremely rapidly, where you talked about an aspirational economy, aspirational tools, and your cell phones being the means of, uh, of, of actually being able to order the world, and every even poor person would have access to cell phones. And now you have a situation where there's been complete deprivation. People have uh, the economy, you know, I don't know, 
we are in terrible terrible times we are in terrible terrible times uh, we hope that it gets better and i'm sure it's get better we'll all go through this but uh, the question is not that the question is uh, of course uh, in many ways uh, there is a difference there is a difference and there are people who don't have access to to the online media are in to some ways disadvantaged um, but as i said you know you know we have to ensure what is the benefit of everybody and we have to ensure that uh, somehow or the other uh, those at the bottom are brought up as swami vivekananda would always say that uh, uh, it is easy to pull people down but more difficult to bring people up uh, ramono loya ironically also said that that the whole thing is you know he's been misinterpreted very is differently but ramono loya also said that that the duty of those who are benefited are to ensure that uh, those who are not as were disadvantaged uh, benefit or get that benefit so it depends upon institutions like nujs to ensure that uh, this online classes is not restricted only to those who have uh, those who can economically benefit or those who have the economic uh, ways and means to do it, but should go to everybody but does that mean that you should shut down online courses so that no one gets benefit from it i don't think that serves the purpose but that now puts a bigger burden on institutions to 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 ensure that the benefits goes to everybody else yeah yeah and and possibly you know as we are using uh, platform online platform we can make it open to the other law colleges other students yes. uh, well, those who are not from nujs but take benefit of the uh, lectures of nujs yes. or yes. or whatever yes. program we are organizing yes. yeah there is there is one more question from biswas agarwal yes uh, biswas is asking that so do you think that the reservation policy is detrimental for a socialist country like india as i said you know the fact that we incorporated um, reservation or affirmative action into our constitution is unique it was path breaking when it was done it was very unusual so to say that uh, you know we didn't formulate or we didn't envisage a reservation uh, policy is wrong and I, as i always say this we've come a long way a lot of the odds have been even, a lot of the odds have been even. i don't think we can even sort of uh, sort of even contemplate what sort of an unequal society we inherited but we we even doubt a lot of the odds but um, my view is but there is but there's still caste uh, oppression all of us know it uh, it may not be so apparent in the cities uh, where economics may be a criteria for for uh, disadvantage but in the villages caste still forms even in west bengal and in lighten state like west bengal anyone will tell you if you go to a village there is still discrimination based on caste and it's still there it may seem unusual for people like us who are in uh, in towns and who have this wonderful education but it still exists and till that exists still that exists there is scope for affirmative action i'm very clear on that you know yeah you know vikram ji you are so right Uh, in our ancestral place in uh, birbhum you see the people are so accustomed or they have taken this into the system that they don't want to come to the temple and enter into the temple and offer puja they think that they yeah. they they should not yeah. do that you know that yeah. that they have already, yeah. already you know they have taken it into the system that uh, us, uh, you may allow us but we do not want to go in yeah. so it, it's it's very uh, very 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 true uh mr arnab bosu has a question you know it is that uh, what are his views with the way in which socialism was included in the preamble why did the constituent assembly not include the term into the preamble into our constitution during its formulation so possibly that uh, well, I, I, answer between... that. i think that, you know baba saheb ambedkar was very clear yeah. he got up actually and he said that we don't want to burden the constitution with these values which may change and we don't want to sort of make it legally implementable but all the controversial sort of these fantastically interesting ideas gandhianism socialism etc etc were kept in dpsps so that you know governance could be measured upon it but it was clearly not made legally implementable because 
Baba Sahib Ambedkar was the person who came out with the actual legal reasoning. And I'm sure there was a thinking behind it uh, that we wanted the constitution to be a power controlling document. We don't want values which would color the constitution. Yeah. Uh, Adit oh, Raja Gopal oh. has a question. Uh, sir, given the court succumbed to government discre uh, discretion, especially the government of the day when it comes to the socialism, be it the aspect of land acquisition or nationalization. I'm sorry, once more, Oyman. Yeah. Uh, Adit Raja mm -hmm. Gopal is asking, sir, given yeah. that court succumbed to government discretion, the government of the day, when it comes to the socialism, be it the aspect of land acquisition or nationalization. Okay. Um, does the court succumb to that? I think, uh, you know, the governments as well as political parties, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I have a controversial take on that, reflect what the people actually think. You know, that it's very easy to say, uh, and we tend to make that mistake. It takes a burden off ourselves when we say, that, you know, it's the political parties who are misleading, uh, you know, the people. That never happens. People want something and it's the political parties who articulate that. Because in a democracy, that's how they get to power. So in many ways, even the courts reflect that. Um, and this sort of, for the want of a better word, and, I, and I'm not quite comfortable with using the word politics, but I'm saying these underlying tensions uh, play out within the court. Because we are all humans, we all come from within the society. And for better or for worse, uh, there is a tendency to, uh, to reflect the broader consensus. Uh, it's another matter what that consensus is. Um, because there seems to be, um, increasingly in India, two different consensus. One is, as only one sort of uh, flagged right in the beginning, there is a consensus of Bharat, which has different economic and social consensus, and maybe even political consensus. And is the other is the consensus of India, which is celebrity, which is NUJS, NLS, uh, Vikramjit Banerjee, Anirban, and a lot of us who, who've traveled the world, who've traveled in India, who had the wonderful benefit of this wonderful education, and, and including those people who talk on social media, these wonderful celebrities, people who exist on media, they have a different consensus. So on, you know, what is the consensus of India is, is the question which is uh, coming more and more and clashing with each other. Uh, but broadly, the court reflects social consensus. Government also reflects that. The courts also reflect that. Mohammed Zaid has a question. Uh, yes. Do you think that court have exhibited undue difference in backing the market free policies, refusing to entertain challenges thereon on the ground of socialism, diluting socialism to be a pragmatic one? Yeah, um, I'll I'll answer that. You know that, that's exactly what I was saying because courts are, who are judges? The judges are humans. Judges come from society like ours, and we've seen that. Only about uh, you, uh, you know. I'll, I'll say what we have seen. Uh, which you haven't seen, and I, I'm not being facetious, I'm not being patronizing, but that's because we are older, we've gone through a period when we uh, grew up in, a, in what we considered a socialist India, then we saw the development of market economics, and now we see the wheel coming uh, circle. Now, we have seen that the uh, judges also you know, are humans, they come from a society like us, and they reflect those broader changes in society. The, uh, the way the courts interpreted socialism in the 70s and the 80s uh, is radically different from what happened in the 90s. And I'm sure, and, and I'm sure it will be interpreted differently after the pandemic in 2020. Uh, so that's the end of that question. You know, at the end of the day, we are all humans. And, you know, as I think it was, Oniban is great at this. I think it was it Oliver Wendell Holmes who said yes. that it was, Yes, you know, after judges are all human. And uh, all, it's absolutely human. And so uh, it's not that they have shown deference. It is just actually they believe that the consensus was that should be more market. Market was a better tool to achieve uh, a better, a fairer society. They actually believed it. 
I'm not saying that, you know, I know because I was part of it. And I know that in the beginning, as I said, you know, we all thought we screamed. I screamed personally at socialist professors in my in in the national law school. And I thought they were completely wrong. And I was, I was genuinely convinced that they were completely wrong. And it's not that I was doing it because I wasn't convinced. It was, uh, that was, that was how it was. Uh, so, you know, in many ways, that is how it, uh, you know, I don't think the judges themselves have shown any deference, but the judges have been convinced and they've been convinced because that was the consensus, existing consensus. Hello, can I can I be heard? Can I be heard? Hello. Hello. Can I be heard? Yeah. yeah, so we can hear you. I think um, Professor Mazumdar had some audio issues. I'll just continue okay. with the question and answer session. Yes, yes. Um, yes. So Shreya Stalin asks, Sir, your views on moving towards an economic basis for reservation. Is it time to apply a creamy layer concept in letter and spirit, keeping in mind the recent 10% EWS quota? See, uh, two things. Number one, I don't want to uh, go into the uh, details of... Uh, uh, the reservation issues, simply because I may be asked to appear in this matter. So I don't want to comment on the nitty gritties of, of each and every case. Uh, but my view is this, that you know we need a pragmatic interpretation, whatever be it, we need a pragmatic interpretation of the entire concept of a reservation. And I think broadly, again, the consensus of the country seems to be coming around to that, even from within those people who have benefited from reservation. I have seen this from people who have benefited from reservation themselves, who are willing to give up reservation, and, and they've been very forthright on that. Yeah, is there any other question? Bikr Hello, Bikramjit. Uh, yes, yes. Can you? Yeah, Bikramjit, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you now. Yeah, yeah. Because for a few minutes, I, I, you know, it got. No, I thought that I couldn't be heard. I thought I couldn't be heard. No, no, no. I yeah. couldn't hear you, and I assume that I couldn't be heard. Uh, yeah. There is one more question. Is it? In your yeah. moving towards the economic basis for reservation, did you answer this yeah, one? I have answered that. I just answered. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. 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 Yeah. Is there any other question? No. If there is no other question, shall I call it? Uh, so, Bikram, Bikramjit, it was uh, so very interesting. You know, it is always uh, very interesting to hear you. And as always, Bikramjit in his speech has examined socialist view with Indian flavor. And I like that middle part where he examined land reforms, nationalization, labor rights, and reservation from the angle of uh, you know socialism. And his description of socialism with Indian flavor, historically stressing from the uh, you know uh, constituent assembly debate till today, and uh, you know I'm sure all the students they uh, liked it and they were enriched. Bikramjit, it was so nice that you could spend some time from your busy schedule, and we all were benefited. And looking forward to see you again. Thank you. Looking Thank forward you to very much. Thank, Thank you very much. much.